they had allowed him a shower, at least. Tempest, on the other hand, had gone first. When she stumbled out of the exam room, deep within Umbral's hospital, she was still wearing her bloodstained kit from earlier. She had washed her face, and the pale skin of it stood stark against the sand-crusted skin of her neck and the black of her uniform. She turned to Hawkeye, who sat up straight, knowing if she was finished, then it was his turn for the debrief. An ocean of things passed between the two soldiers, all of the things they had been through in the last 24 hours, all of the hate and distrust and anger, the trauma bond of the aliens skittering around in their heads, begrudging respect, and beneath it all, a thread of trust that Hawkeye found distasteful. It was unlike him. I didn't let you die out there, Tempest's eyes said. I didn't let you die out there either. Maybe he should have. At one point, she had been ready to put her hands around his neck. You didn't kill her when you had the chance, huh? I guess even an old dog can learn new tricks sometimes, Cypher added, unwelcome and nauseating. He kept his face neutral, watching Tempest swallow before she spoke. Uh, they're not happy we got caught, and were compromised, or whatever. Just a heads up. Hawkeye gave her a single nod, Satisfied that she had done her social duty of speaking to him at least once, Tempest put her hands in her dirty, grimy pockets and headed out towards the locker rooms on the upper levels. A few minutes later, a nondescript nurse came out and retrieved him, and Hawkeye followed her to the back. He expected to go to an exam room, but the nurse mildly surprised him when she turned a corner and took him to a small conference room instead. She didn't speak, which he preferred, but as soon as she opened the door and ushered him inside the conference room, he knew that his brief, silent respite was over. Hawkeye had this uncanny ability to tell when someone was going to be a talker. Anyone Umbral hired who wore perfectly tailored suits and looked like they had been styled within an inch of their life would always be a talker. The intensely clean-cut look was just another sort of armor, one that made people think they were entirely professional while they slowly stripped their entire lives down to the bone before taking ownership. The conference room looked like all the others he had spent miserable hours in. Clean, sleek, metallic, and soulless. The umbral agent in question was standing behind the dark wood table while a small grouping of medical professionals was sitting, not even bothering to look up from the notes they were taking. Corporal Carmona, the suit warbled, his voice sing-song and saccharine. It made Hawkeye flinch from a combination of hearing his name and the promise of machinations held within that voice. Have a seat. Hawkeye did, suddenly wishing he had been the one to come into this interrogation, dirt-crusted and still in his full kit. Sitting in front of all the people dressed in whatever sort of armor their jobs provided, the suit and the three doctors in crisp white lab coats edged in different colors to represent their specialties. Their clothes said, This is who I am. Hawkeye in the gray sweats available to the team in every one of the locker rooms, was without an identity. He missed the weight of his rifle on his back and the pressing comfort of his helmet on his head. The suit lifted a tablet from the table in front of him, flipping through digital pages before he began speaking. You are now being recorded for our files. I have here Corporal James Carmona, a sniper for Team Ares under the Eclipse Initiative. He briefly went missing during the mission at Flatiron Mine today, 
along with Private Pack. But they were both recovered by the rest of their team. The cause of the disappearance was an unidentified entity we've currently labeled Flatiron Entity 2. The agent looked up from his tablet briefly. Your file was an interesting read. It isn't often we have second-generation umbral assets. Your father was Sergeant Jack Carmona, right? Feeling uneasy, Hawkeye nodded. We lost him at Operation Blackwater Ridge, right? You must have been young. Fourteen or fifteen, if my math is right. Putting his hands in his lap under the table, Hawkeye clenched his fists until his short nails began to dig into the flesh of his hands. He nodded. The suit shook his head sadly. What a tragedy. Umbral weren't as thorough as they are now. There was no way to know that the ridge was rigged with so many explosives. Hawkeye closed his eyes, and for a beat, allowed himself to remember. James Carmona was a star at the Umbral Youth Barracks back then. His father was a legend, and while his grandfather had fought for a superpower that Umbral and the other megacorporations had cowed completely, there was still quiet respect and awe attached to the American Medal of Honor recipient. All of which made James a prodigy, and prodigies got away with a lot more than the others at Umbral's brand new military academy. At the age he should have been learning to ride a bike, his father had instead deposited the youngster in front of a rifle scope. And from there, the story told itself. In front of his father, Jack Jr., James was all salutes and yes sirs. But at the academy, well, it wasn't like he had as much time as a kid to let loose. Not with Sergeant Jack as his father. So, he was just making up for lost time. He was incorrigible, always sneaking out, talking over instructors that he thought weren't nearly as talented as he was, getting into fights, and at the same time, earning the highest marks possible. Just to even stuff out. He couldn't be all bad, after all. The day it all changed, he was freshly turned 15, in a field a few miles from the barracks, setting up pop-up tents with all the other boys in his unit. They were alone, but not really. Their instructor camped nearby to keep an eye on them and rate how well they were doing in their survival test. Being the loudest and highest scoring, James was the example and the other pairs looked over at him as he worked. He first noticed that something was up when all the other kids stopped working, standing up straight and looking east. James stopped and turned too, holding his hand over his eyes to see better. A jeep was approaching over the bumpy ground, Hunter Green and way too clean to belong to the youth barracks. It stopped directly in front of James's tent. His heart skipped a beat and kicked into overdrive, dread settling over him before he even saw the occupants. He just knew that something was wrong. It was the sixth sense that the Carmonas had, the sniper's sense. Three men exited the vehicle. First was the head of the youth barracks, Commandant Whitmore, followed by a tall man he didn't know, dressed in the black-on-black -black gear he recognized as the Eclipse Initiative kit. His father wore the same. The third, though, rendered the other two men pointless. Because the third was old, his left leg ended at the knee before continuing in a gleaming metal prosthetic, wearing a jacket with a camo pattern that hadn't been used in decades. First Sergeant Jack Carmona Sr., his grandfather. Around him, 
the boys had popped into salutes when the commandant had appeared. But as soon as his grandfather exited the jeep, their salutes had gotten so intense, backs curved with the force of it, that it was almost comical. James wasn't saluting. His grandpa wouldn't want him to anyway. The stranger cleared his throat, fixing James with a gaze that held an untold amount of regret. <clears throat> I'm First Lieutenant Delacroix of the Eclipse Initiative. I'm afraid there's been an accident involving your father. I'm going to need you to come with us. James didn't hear him because his grandpa was opening his arms and there were tears on the lined cheeks of a man that barely spoke, let alone cried. James dropped the tent stakes he was holding and ran into the arms of his grandfather, who held him as the boy started to sob silently. Jack Sr. smelled like Old Spice aftershave and the astringent scent of pain relief gel. He held James like the world was ending. Probably because it was. For the two of them, at least. I've got you, kid, Jack Sr. said, voice breaking. I've got you. He was snapped out of the memory when the agent spoke again. Mr. Carmona, are you... Swallowing an ancient grief, Hawkeye cut his hand through the air, the same signal they would have used on the battlefield for silence. Hawkeye. The other man raised one perfectly arched eyebrow. I'm sorry? It's his code name. The small doctor, the one with his coat edged in navy blue, said without looking up from his notes. Hawkeye looked closer at him and under a pair of thick glasses, he saw the shining scar tissue. Howard Brighton, the exobiologist they had worked with. They're weird about that. Just go with it. We're not in the trenches. I hardly think... Hawkeye's jaw worked. I don't know you. You don't know me. Strangers don't get to use my name. Just... Go with it. Howard enunciated his words carefully, talking to the suit like he was a moron, earning him a single grain of respect from Hawkeye. Fine. Hawkeye. The suit sounded put out, but tried to keep that overly sweet shell over his voice. I'm Agent Sinclair, and I'll be the one briefing you today. Look, I know you usually speak with... Eclipse Initiative agents, but considering the odd happenings during your previous mission, Umbral felt that I was a better fit. He didn't elaborate why he was a better fit, Hawkeye noticed. After this, you will, understandably, go through a psychological evaluation and a physical exam, as well as a neurological check by Dr. Brighton here. I understand you have a prototype computer-to-brain interface chip installed, correct? Yes. How would you say that implant is working out for you, Mr. Uh, Hawkeye? Fine, he said, stomach roiling and head pounding as Cypher seemed to stretch to life inside of his psyche. Hawkeye showed no emotion, no discomfort on the outside but he sure as hell felt it. Oh? It says here you experience migraines after the initial upload. It's an implant. In my brain. Sinclair's lips thinned. Yes, but... Hawkeye wasn't the only one annoyed by the random tangent of questioning. Howard sighed heavily. <sighs> he has regular checkups with the Nero team. I could give you the notes if you'd like them. The agent's glare bordered on furious, but he kept his smile in place. Yes, that would be helpful, but believe it or not, this line of questioning does pertain to the previous mission. 
all of the members of Team Ares described being mentally affected by the unidentified entity, with Miss Pack being the most affected. Were you similarly affected? Your mind is too crowded. The alien had told him. Hawkeye repressed a shiver. I experienced changes in my perception of reality, and my perception of time was altered. But I never felt out of control of myself, or that the unidentified entity had any effect on my implant. It seemed to evaluate the two of us, and found Tempest better suited to whatever it needed. But she and I managed to escape. I feel no after effects besides the physical fatigue that is to be expected. Anything else? The entire team in front of him seemed flabbergasted at his long, almost eloquent speech. He felt a spark of amusement. Just because he was normally quiet didn't mean that he was an idiot. My two cadet, my insights, if you wanted, Cypher offered and was ignored. Th thank you, Hawkeye. The agent cleared his throat while the doctors whispered amongst themselves. The room was filled only with the sound of pencil lead on paper. So, just to confirm, you are experiencing no physical or mental effects? None. Right. After all, how impactful can an alien even be when you live with ghosts? He wanted this to be over, desperately. When he was exhausted, hurt, or emotionally unstable, Cypher filtered to the forefront of his thoughts. It wasn't unlivable. Cypher really, rarely took control. If the dead man really was some biological ghost in the machine, he had picked the worst candidate. Hawkeye was, in most cases, unmovable. Still, every once in a while he opened his mouth, and the Russian's voice came out. It would have driven a lesser man to insanity. But either Hawkeye was already insane, hence the dead man's voice, or he was successfully withstanding the intrusion. For now. Sinclair paced around the table, circling like a shark. Ares has had a rough go of it lately, hmm? What with the death of Private Kozlov, the injury of Sergeant Gideon, the accidental death of one of our top marine specialists, and the little... incident where we lost contact with Private Pack and Corporal Alvarez. I see you didn't attend any sort of counseling after Private Kozlov's death. You were the only one of Ares that didn't. The agent let the words hang in the air. Hawkeye narrowed his eyes, taking in the subtle cues of Sinclair's body language and the expression on his face. Is this guy fucking with me? Hawkeye thought. The truth of it was that only a handful of people, the highest ranking members of Umbral and the Eclipse Initiative, knew that he had been the one to assassinate Cypher. But still, who approved this line of questioning? We at Umbral just worry about your mental health, is all. Does it weigh heavy on your soul? Of course it did, damn it. When he agreed to be Umbral's spear all those years ago, their assassin, their fist, he had been young and hot-headed. The last dredges of the dumb kid he had been shining bright like a supernova before they burn out forever. He had wanted it. Wanted the glory. Wanted a special place at the right hand of some of the most powerful people on the planet. Wanted to fill his father's shoes. And then some. Because maybe, maybe if he could be better than his dad in every single way, if he grew past his accomplishments, the hole left in Hawkeye from the loss of him might finally be filled. It wasn't. It was only worse. 
when all the brashness of youth was done, Hawkeye was just a husk, a silent oath keeper, a quiet hammer of whatever twisted justice Umbral wanted to dole out. So why, why was Cypher so different? He didn't even like the kid in the beginning. With an accent as thick as his skull, Cypher had been loud, inexcusably clumsy, but so brilliant that nothing else mattered. He had never seen anything like it. Ares would need to infiltrate a stronghold, and Hawkeye would prepare for a fight. But security systems fell at Cypher's feet, like worshippers kneeling in the pews. Cypher would clear the way, cut the lights in buildings, whatever they needed. It made Ares unstoppable. Cypher allowed them to move like invisible wraiths. The kid had come in with Tempest, and he disliked her so much that it tempered his annoyance with Cypher. She lived up to her name, and Hawkeye had no room for hurricanes in the sniper's nest. Sentinel would pair him with Cypher, Hawkeye guarding the hacker's back while he worked and Cypher in turn monitoring the situations from high up next to Hawkeye. Gradually, he warmed up to the kid. Cypher liked Hawkeye, for some damn reason. He could go entire days ignoring him, and he'd still be just as thrilled to be paired with a sniper on the next job. He was young, earnest, and unlike the other young blood, precise. He respected Precision. I respected you too. Thought you'd be a good leader. That you had it in you to take over after Sentinel. Until you put the gun to my head. And pulled the trigger. Hawkeye remembered with crystalline clarity. Assassinating Cypher. The brilliant idiot had delved much too deep into secrets Umbral was guarding. Hawkeye was their spear, so he forced himself to disassociate and did the job, only coming back to himself when he felt the weight of the kid in his arms, smelled the iron of his blood, and tasted it when it lingered in the back of his throat. A chasm had opened up in him that night, waves of shame and grief lapping at the edges. He ignored it. The tour through his life's history was getting to be too much, and Hawkeye finally told Sinclair as much. Great. Mental health. Got it. Are we done here? I understand you're probably tired. So, in full, recount the day from when you first recognized that your perception was being altered by an outside source to when you and the rest of the team dispatched the entity. After that, we're done. Unhappily, Hawkeye did, droning and monotone. There were a few parts he planned to omit. Fist fighting with Tempest in a hallucinated sea vault, Cypher's corpse watching them, and the part where the alien complained about the lack of space in his head. Except, when he got to that part where the alien had spoken into his mind. A realization hit Hawkeye. Hard. Your mind is too crowded, he thought. That's what it had said. Too crowded. A being outside of himself had looked into his head and inside saw Cypher, which meant it wasn't guilt Shame, or a malfunction of the brain-to-computer interface. Hell, it wasn't even mental illness. Cypher's ghost was there. Hawkeye stuttered, but continued on, the pause going unnoticed. Inside, though, he was in turmoil. In the beginning, he would have been thankful for some confirmation that he wasn't losing his mind. Now, though, anything was preferable to Cypher's voice being real. 
He kept talking, but his mind was racing through all the moments he had felt the weakest. The times Cypher had been closest to the surface. Cursing in Russian on the Spire mission had been bad. Cypher all but screaming at him about what he was doing wrong. But that hadn't been the worst. The Genesis mission was the closest Hawkeye had ever come to asking to be left behind. Mere hours before departure, he had been called to the bioengineering wing of the Umbral Hospital and told he would receive a new computer to brain upload. This time, with all the information of how Raptor had been altered, and what to do if Umbral's newest shiny toy lost his shit. Hawkeye was to monitor Raptor for the extent of the mission and report back. It was, thankfully, way less information than he had been given regarding Cypher's old job, but something about linking up to the interface a second time had made him violently ill. He kept his cool until he was back at his apartment, where he spent the next hour wrapped around the ceramic bowl of his toilet, his head pounding so hard he thought he might die. It had also woken up Cypher, and Cypher had taken full advantage. Just sit back. Let me run the show. Wouldn't it be easier? Unless we're murdering more teammates tonight. I'll sit that one out. It had gotten so bad that he called Aegis. He knew she wasn't fond of him, but she was a professional, at least, and dosed him with something that took the pain out of his skull in an instant. Instead, it just felt like his head was stuffed with cotton. He remembered looking at Aegis as his pain abated while she shined a light into his eyes checking his pupils. Cypher was right there, looking back at her, right along with Hawkeye. As clear as day, he was assaulted with the vision of her deep in his guts of Svalbard, wiping her forehead with her hand, unaware that it was covered in Cypher's blood. The red against her pale skin, the smell of iron and copper, Cypher offering Hawkeye half a chocolate bar he had snuck into the seed vault, just hours before Hawkeye sunk a bullet into his gray matter. He had shoved Aegis away, just in time to make it back to the toilet and vomit again. Nothing but yellow, foamy bile. The doctor-turned-soldier wiped his head with a damp cloth, even when he pushed her away. Called him an asshole and gave him a double dose of nausea medication. She regrets not being able to save me, Cypher had murmured. I regret not being able to save you, Hawkeye replied. Nothing improved from there. He was on edge the entire mission, watching Raptor constantly, and then being faced with a kid that could move things with her mind. All while Cypher was trying his damnedest to take control of his. Hawkeye had been shaking, sweaty and shivering all at the same time. Pissed that Raptor needed to be babysat while being clearly earmarked to take Sentinel's place instead of Hawkeye. Mentally exhausted from pushing Cypher back. He had never been in worse shape in the field. And then Aegis the same Aegis who had worn Cypher's blood like war paint, who had fought tooth and nail to save Raptor, who had come to his apartment half-dressed in her battle kit before the mission just to help him with a headache. That same Aegis had stepped out of line, out of the perfectly crafted, always obeyed formation of Ares and the Eclipse Initiative, to protect some kid. And in doing so, reminded Hawkeye who he was. Umbral's spear. Don't you fucking dare, Cypher had said, racking invisible hands across his brain, the pain bright, discordant. Don't. He didn't even remember pulling the gun, 
looking down the iron sights at Aegis' bared face. His arms shook, the ghost of his squadmate fighting for control. Sentinel's voice booming in his ears, Stand down! And then, only in his mind, the echo from decades ago ringing in his ear, I'm afraid there has been an accident involving your father. He didn't shoot the medic and stood by while his commander let her and Tempest abscond with what should have been Umbral's property. He had hated them both at that moment. How could they be so stupid? No kid, no person, nothing was worth what Umbral would do if they found out. Why couldn't they just follow the damned rules? He hated them, but not as much as he hated himself and his moment of weakness that he couldn't take back. He drew on a teammate. He wasn't even sure what the weakness really was. Drawing on her or failing to shoot her before she imploded Ares. After finishing his statement of events and answering a few more inane questions, Hawkeye was finally released to the doctors. He felt hollowed out. His exhaustion had affected him so much that the past had slipped in and picked at his carefully sewn seams. First was Nero, then Psyche, and finally his physical exam. It was well past midnight when he finally left the exam room, so distracted that he almost ran over Howard Brighton. The smaller man looked tired, but he perked up when he saw the sniper. Howard held up two paper bags, the bottoms of them dark with grease, the tops rolled closed. Here, he all but shoved the bags into Hawkeye's arms. It's a bunch of garbage food. Don't argue. I had to wrestle with the cafeteria people to get this stuff. Hawkeye scowled. Why? Research suggests that high caloric intake is highly beneficial after a significant psychic event like the one you just experienced. Hopes recenter the body back in the real world. He hated to admit it, but the smell of meat and onion was making his stomach growl. Two bags, though. Take one to Tempest. She disappeared too fast for me to get it to her. All you soldier types live in the same apartment building, right? The last thing he wanted to do was see Tempest. But something told him Howard had gone out of his way to feed the two of them. Some leftover gratitude from them pulling him out of the rubble of Viridian Labs. Fine. Great. Enjoy. Hawkeye was almost at the end of the hallway when Howard added, And if you feel off and need some help, my office is in the exobiology department. The offer was vague, but Hawkeye figured that was the point. He didn't bother turning around, but gave the man a thumbs up. Tempest lived on the first floor, so it wasn't terribly out of his way to deliver the bag of, as Howard described it, garbage food. He didn't personally care if she ate it or not, but he didn't want to hear her complaints if she discovered he tossed her dinner into the garbage. He'd talked to her enough in the last 24 hours to last a lifetime. Hawkeye deposited the bag on the entry mat of the nondescript door. After knocking once, he turned and hurried for the elevator, wanting to avoid any unnecessary interactions. But he wasn't quick enough. Hawkeye heard the door open, but didn't turn around, hoping she'd just grab and go. But it was late. The other soldier must have been sleeping and was slow to get what was going on. Hey, did you... bring me dinner? Cursing internally, Hawkeye turned slowly to face her. No. Tempest was holding the bag, 
confusion written all over her face. Dressed in a sweatshirt and bike shorts, her dark hair down, she looked nothing like the woman who wanted to kill him so recently when they were both trapped in their shared delusion. Then, what? Dr. Brighton said to eat it. Something about calories and recentering. I don't know. She stared at him for a few more beats and then shrugged. Cool. Satisfied that he had gotten the point across, Hawkeye turned to leave once more. Thanks, James. Hawkeye stopped giving her the same back-turned thumbs up as Howard before continuing on. He didn't correct her. Asshole. Hawkeye didn't correct Cypher, either.